The following program is a special presentation brought to you by WXOW 19. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The attack yesterday has caused severe damage. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. I believe that I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Good evening, I'm Amy DuPont. More than 2,000 Americans died on December 7, 1941 during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, launching the U.S. into World War II, a war the United States would eventually win, but not before more than 400,000 American lives were lost. But wars are not just about nations and battles. They're about soldiers, sailors, and Marines, ordinary men who became heroes fighting for their country. Over the next half hour, we hope to share with you the stories of the Wisconsin survivors of Pearl Harbor, told at the place where the war began. The Japanese attack began at 7.48 when the first bombs fell on Wheeler Field. Dive bombers hit the hangars and Zero fighters strafed American planes on the runway. The only thing that saved me was two steel doors. I had a shield ahead of me and then the bomb hit. At 7.55, a dive bomber swooped down on Fort Island and dropped the first bomb on Pearl Harbor. An uncoded message blared from the radio. Attacked on Pearl Harbor, this is no drill. Loud and clear, attacked on Pearl Harbor, this is no drill. The attack was sudden and terrifying. The U.S. Oklahoma took at least six hits and capsized. The West Virginia struck by at least five torpedoes sank. The Utah took three hits and capsized, while the California was sunk by two torpedoes. I knew there was an awful lot of folks that weren't going to go home to meet their mother. There was a lot of kids in there. The Japanese then struck Hickam Field, targeting hangars and planes on the runway. I couldn't do anything. Oh just, just watch what was going on. The attack on Battleship Row continued minutes later. Four armor-piercing bombs hit the Arizona. I looked over the Arizona and I saw daylight under it, completely out of the water. Within minutes, she lay on the harbor floor. Went to the Arizona after the battle to retrieve bodies. That was the worst duty I ever had. By 10 o'clock, the Japanese assault was over, leaving behind an incredible swath of carnage. According to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, 200 Wisconsinites were stationed at Pearl Harbor on that fateful day. More than 40 died. The handful of living survivors are now in their 90s. Their time is running out. That's why the Old Glory Honor Flight of Northeast Wisconsin wanted to take the Wisconsin survivors back to Hawaii to see the monuments built in their honor. The group has taken roughly 1,000 World War II veterans to Washington, D.C. to see those memorials, but a trip to Pearl Harbor had never been done before. Old Glory President Drew McDonald is proud his group was the first to make it happen. It's for the vets. We have several guys in this flight who've never been back since 1941. And to, to be the ones that were to help get them here for that last opportunity, unbelievable experience. It took the Old Glory Group less than one year to raise enough money and volunteers and to prepare 19 Wisconsin survivors for this once in a lifetime journey. But when the day of the trip finally arrived, no one was quite prepared for the emotional send off. Gentlemen, this country owes you more than we can ever repay. To describe you as the greatest generation is an understatement. The lessons you have taught us and continue to teach us 
have made this country great. This is awesome. Yeah. I sure didn't expect anything like this. You don't want to forget what they did for us. It's just, it's really emotional. It's a wonderful trip. After all, some of these men may have been gone from Pearl Harbor for a period of 70 years. Every one of us is very grateful and would like to express our appreciation. I was struck by the fact that you guys were ordinary men called to do extraordinary things, and you did it magnificently. You've led inspirational lives and are truly heroes to me. And the whole Nineteen Wisconsin survivors boarded the plane for Pearl Harbor, but only 18 made it there. Sparta native Mark Scheidel had a heart attack on the plane and died. I had a chance to spend some time with Mark before the trip. Mark Scheidel joined the Navy in 1940. The 18-year-old wanted to see the world aboard a ship. There's my boot camp graduation picture. He was assigned to the USS Boggs and immediately sent to Pearl Harbor. Mark's ship, out on patrol, was making its way back to the harbor when the Japanese attack began. It looked like a swarm of bees coming out of a hive over the island. And all of a sudden we could see the explosions. Seventy years after the attack, Mark could still describe the absolute chaos. We spent an hour just going around Port Island, uh, uh, just moving very slowly. And with men on both sides uh, trying to take bodies aboard and whatever, doing what we could. It took Mark some time to talk about that dreadful day, but he was looking forward to returning to Pearl Harbor to not only honor the men who died there, but to finally share his story with the other men who, like him, made it home. If nothing else, to uh, be with a few guys uh, that was in the same circumstance with me. Mark Scheidel was 90 years old. Just like they did during the war, the group continued on after Mark's death and dedicated their trip to him. One of their first stops in Hawaii was at the USS Arizona Visitor Center. The vets watched a video taken at Pearl Harbor during the attack where some of the survivors began to relive that day. They also walked the grounds, sharing their December 7th memories. Park Ranger Robert Burke says the Wisconsin group was one of the largest group of survivors to ever visit the memorial, and the most memorable of his career. It's special for what they represent. When we look out at the memorial, we see the, the Arizona Memorial itself and the Missouri, the bookends of the U.S. involvement of World War II. These folks bring everything that we stand for to this park. The vets also attended a private ceremony on the Arizona Memorial, where once again they paid tribute to Mark Scheidel. One bell for one life. Forty in all for the Wisconsin men killed during the attack on Pearl Harbor. But on this day, the bell would ring 41 times. Mark and all the faithful departed, eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and may perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Mark Scheidel was supposed to be here on the Arizona with the other Wisconsin survivors. But on his way to Hawaii, the Sparta native had a heart attack and died. Mark would not ask for us to call him a hero. He would say, I just did my job. I was taking care of my shipmates. But I stand here before you today to tell you the truth. Singleman third class, Mark A. Chattel, was a true American hero. Although bonded by war, none of the other survivors knew Mark well. Because I spent some time with Mark before we left for Hawaii, the group asked me to accept an American flag on behalf of Mark's family. On behalf of the Grateful Nation and the National Park Service, I present to you the National Ensign and a testimony of honest and faithful service, Senator Third Class, Mark A. Chateau. An honorable tribute for a member of the greatest generation who, without question, fought for the cause and survived. A man who wanted so much to return to this place one last time with his brothers in arms. He gave us our freedom that we so dearly enjoy today. God bless you, Mark, your family, 
our Pearl Harbor survivors, our veterans, and our country. Shipmate, we have the watch. I had the honor of delivering Mark's flag to his family, something that you will see a little later in this program. Still to come on Return to Pearl Harbor, honoring the fallen, a survivor of the Oklahoma publicly thanks the friends who sacrificed their lives to save others. Plus, we'll take you aboard the USS Missouri for a very special mail call. Return to Pearl Harbor is brought to you by your hometown Chevy dealers. Gunderson Lutheran, and LHI. The Japanese sunk or severely damaged 21 Navy vessels moored in Pearl Harbor. Among them, the USS Oklahoma. The Oki took at least six torpedo hits and capsized. More than 400 sailors and Marines died in her hull. Herb Meyer was one of the lucky ones. His two best friends were not. The white marble standards of the Oklahoma Memorial represent its lost Marines and sailors, 429 in all, in full dress whites, standing at attention, manning the rails of the Oklahoma forever. <coughs> Herb Meyer knew many of them by name. Oh, yeah. Two remain close to his heart. Gowie was his last name. Johnson was another one. Herb's best friends, who on December 7, 1941, ran out of air long before they ran out of courage. Stayed down and they were stationed on the parking magazines. They were spied ammunition to the chamber, gun chambers above. And they were trapped down there, but, and they held the lights. The others too. <laughs> Claude Gowie and Edward Johnson saved the lives of countless men, but no one could save them. And you could hear them guys thumping, rapping on the hull. Furman Balza was among the sailors who tried. We finally got 32 of them out of there. But we, down, we, we smothered some and drowned some. And we did what we had to do because we had no other alternative. Rescuers and the men trapped in the Oklahoma's hull, helpless. You talk about getting shot in the head, piece of cake. But can you imagine being in that hole and waiting for the old Grim Reaper to catch up with you and you've got no chance of... Talk about hell on earth, girl. You're talking about it. Golly, whatever. Unlike the friends he lost, Herb was on deck when the Okie began to list. He escaped by swimming to the nearby Maryland, uninjured, at least physically. Everybody was punchable. The two of them wanted the Congressional Medal. But the loss of his friends still stings as badly today as it did 70 years ago. A salvage crew rolled the Oklahoma upright in 1943 and stripped her of her guns. However, she sank while being towed to the mainland in 1947. It wasn't until 2007 that a memorial in Pearl Harbor was dedicated in her honor. The Utah, also sunk by the Japanese torpedoes, still remains in Pearl Harbor. Her partially submerged hull sits above the water off of Ford Island, rusting, with 54 men entombed inside. Shortly after the attack, Chuck Davis searched the harbor for survivors. He says it was the worst duty he was ever assigned. Chuck doubted he would find anyone alive until he reached the Utah. I was in a motor on picking up guys, and there was two sitting on the capsized ship. I took them, uh, I think I took them to IEA Landing. Chuck never saw the men again, but he believes they survived. Other than being wet and stranded, neither man appeared injured. The USS Missouri, now docked in Pearl Harbor, was not involved in the December 7th attack. She was not even commissioned until 1944, almost three years after the U.S. entered the war. The Missouri earned her place of honor in Pearl Harbor because it was on her deck the Japanese surrendered to the Allies. And this is where World War II came to an end on what's now known as the surrender deck of the USS Missouri. On Sunday, September 2nd, 1945, the Japanese signed the instrument of surrender right here above that gold memorial. The Allies' representatives on this side of the table behind Army General Douglas MacArthur, our bodies were facing forward on the battleship Missouri just like the stars are leading forward to the future. So the only ones back then that had to face the past was the 11 representatives of Japan.
stepping onto the Missouri was special for Chuck Davis. He boarded the ship wearing the jumper he was issued back in 1940. The Navy retired the jumper while Chuck was in boot camp. He never had a chance to wear it on a battleship until now. I saved this. I thought I might want to see it again someday. And uh, I can still fit in it. <laughs> All of the vets took a step back in time while on the Missouri. During the war, letters from home were the only contact the men had with their loved ones. Before the vets left for Pearl Harbor, the Old Glory Group asked friends and family to write to the men again. Photographer Nick Bjerke captured this special mail call. Mail call! George Hutton! I think it's from your great-grandsons. Oh my God. Have an awesome day. <laughs> I've had several, Ian. <laughs> Thank you. You're truly someone who represents an ideal American. Someone who has not only defended our country, Pearl Harbor, but someone who loves and continues to take an interest in our country. Very happy to get that, Trish. Thank you. They are really glued. Of course, I'm all thumbs anyway. <laughs> the sacrifices that you and the rest of the men on your ship made for our country are remarkable. I am proud to have you as my uncle. I wish you a fabulous trip and many more years of health and prosperity. Love you always. Joey Dellenbach. Whoa. <laughs> well, it's great. Absolutely. I don't know how you convince some of these people to write, you know. <laughs> they haven't done it voluntarily. <laughs> oh, look at that, Chief. <laughs> Overwhelming. <laughs> Oh, lordy, lordy, lordy. I get nieces and nephews. Oh, man. They touched me, those two did. Wow. Also included in the vet's mail was a proclamation by Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker declaring June 16, 2012, Pearl Harbor Veteran Remembrance Day. Coming up, meet a Madison man who survived the bombing on Hickam Field. His incredible story when Return to Pearl Harbor continues. Return to Pearl Harbor is brought to you by your hometown Chevy dealers. Gunderson Lutheran and LHI. The first Japanese bomb to strike American soil hit Wheeler Field. Ken Sweet was on guard duty. After the first wave of bombers passed by, Ken jumped into action. Returning to the flight line, he separated the burning planes from the ones the Japanese missed and started rebuilding aircraft to make them flyable. Ken was not injured during the attack, but says it changed his life. As he dropped his bombs, he banked away, headed towards the mountain. And as he banked, then we saw the rising sun. And you knew instantly we're at war. And then that instant is when I grew up. On the other side of the island, Ewald Cookie Cook barely escaped the bombing of the 3200 barracks on Hickam Field. Cookie returned to Hickam to tell his story to a local historian, a story she thought he had taken to his grave. When Ewald Cookie Cook returned to Hickam Field, history came back to life. We thought he'd passed away. Jesse Higa runs the Hickam History Club. She thought Cookie's last name, Cook, was spelled C-O-O-K. -okay. With no record of a Mr. Cook, Jesse believed Cookie had died, taking his story with him. But Cook is actually spelled K-O-C-H. So for Wisconsin to bring Cookie all the way here to come see me, or Hickam, his home, has been an answered prayer. Cookie's prayers were answered here as well, 70 years ago. My bunk was right about up in here on the second floor. Cookie was inside getting ready for church when the first Japanese bomb struck his barracks. He came flying out of the front door, across the courtyard here, dodging Japanese bullets. He made his way across the street to a parking lot where he finally was able to take cover underneath the car. It would be over there. Another soldier took cover with Cookie. The young man laid between Cookie and the barracks and took the brunt of the bomb blast, shrapnel ripping through his body. He says, my foot's gone. So I put a tourniquet on his leg, 
until the bombing was over with. And when we got him to the hospital. Cookie was also injured, suffering third degree burns on his thigh. Well, it was terrible. Cookie would spend several weeks in the hospital where he tried to find the young man who he believes saved his life. But the soldier's injuries were so severe, he was flown to the mainland and never returned. It wasn't until this year that Cookie learned the name of the boy who lay underneath the car with him. Jack Fox lost his leg but survived the war. He died in 1994. Well, 776 of the men killed during the attack on Pearl Harbor are buried in the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, also known as the Punch Bowl. Construction of the cemetery began in August of 1948 and was completed in September of 49. The first interments were done January 4, 1949, but the gates did not open to the public until July 19th of that year. More than 53,000 veterans are buried or interned at the Punch Bowl, which was declared full on August 1st, 1991 for in-ground burials. However, cremated remains are still accepted. Among the men buried there is Glenwood Stevenson, brother of Wisconsin Pearl Harbor survivor Clyde Stevenson. The last time Clyde saw his brother was in 1938, the summer before Glenwood graduated from West Point. Clyde learned of his brother's death in a letter from his parents a month after it happened. Gledwood Stevenson died on April 21, 1942. The pilot was returning from a mission over New Guinea when he hit a mountain. He was originally buried in Australia, and then, and then uh, uh, they could, uh, the bodies could be brought back here, and, and my parents asked for to have the body brought back. Clyde has returned to Hawaii four times to visit his brother's grave. Sadly, he never made the trip with his parents. When we return, coming home, the Wisconsin survivors return to the mainland for an emotional reunion with Mark Scheidel's family. No matter where we were, at the airport, on a military base, or even at the beach, everyone we came in contact with wanted to meet the Wisconsin survivors and thank them for their service. When we stepped off the plane back in Chicago, cheering crowds and a military color guard greeted us at the gate. But the homecoming was bittersweet. Mark Scheidel's cousins were also waiting for the veterans to return. It was my privilege to deliver to them a flag flown in Mark's honor. This flag was flown above the Arizona Memorial. It was unfolded by the National Park Service, and a captain from the Navy presented it to me, and I had the pleasure and honor of giving it back to your family. Thank you. I'm sure he went all happy because he was smiling at it. Just priceless. Mark was laid to rest on Friday, June 22nd with full military honors. We cannot begin to thank the Scheidel family and the Wisconsin survivors who shared their stories with us. We are honored to have told their stories. Thank you to the Old Glory Honor Flight for allowing us to come along on this once in a lifetime journey. And thank you for watching. Good night.